Thank you for taking the time to watch this step-by-step -step video on completing the Desktop Monitoring Instrument, or DMI, for the school year 2023. My name is Val Murdoch, and I am the Title I Monitoring and Support Specialist at the Utah State Board of Education. What I would like to um, go over first are the different levels of support that are available in completing the DMI. The first is obviously this recording. And I'd like to go over just a few uh, things that would make viewing this YouTube video a little more user friendly. This is last year's uh, recording. And so you'll notice on last year's, there are timestamps. If you click the more, you can see all of the timestamps and the topics under those timestamps. This will allow you to fast forward, find maybe you're only, you only need help on one item. You can get to that item a little more quickly by using the timestamps. There are also chapters. If you click the view all, those chapters appear on the scrollable menu over on this side. Along with the link to this video, you should have received uh, also this document that has this year's DMI uh, updates. You'll notice that it has the due date of December 1st and also the URL to access the, the DMI. If you have multiple years of experience, you probably do not need to watch the video, uh, although you might go to use those timestamps to watch certain sections of it. You may just be able to look at this document and understand what is needed for this year. For those of you who are new or because you only complete this one time a year, it, it feels like you're new. Um, I just like to go over this document quickly. There are three things you can do to reduce most of the common problems that people encounter when completing the DMI. The first one is to answer all the criteria questions. So for each part of the DMI, you need to answer questions that will then auto-populate questions specific to your LEA. Um, you cannot leave it marked none, otherwise you will not get the submit button at the end. So make sure that you answer all the criteria questions, either yes or no. Make sure to click save after everything. I know that sounds easy to do, but often the save button is not in your view and you have to scroll down the page to find it. And then finally, just because at the end you click the submit button doesn't mean that you are finished. You need to click it one more time to confirm. There are instructions on how to access forms in the DMI, how to upload forms and URLs, and those will I'll go over in the specific items uh, related to those. Like I mentioned, there are criteria questions, and this year we're on cycle three, so there are four cycles, and the current cycle is cycle three. That make, We break it down so you don't have to answer um, 20,000 questions every year, just 10,000. Um, and then there is the annual core. So cycle three has two questions to, to respond to, and the annual core has six. Again, make sure you don't need any of those mark none. Cycle three, if you are a district, so you answer these two questions, you answer the question, yes, we are a district, then you will have one, two, three items to respond to in cycle three. If you are a charter, you will have one, two items to respond to. The red color coding means that an upload is required or that a change to that item has been made. Most of the red has to do with just the uploads and getting your attention to specific requirements. For the other part of the DMI, the annual core, you will notice that um, last year I gave you the warning that you would need to upload the URL to your LEA webpage. Well, it's next year. So an upload will be required, and I'll go more into that when we get to the annual core um, item, number one. Um, going through this, again, most of these are uploads that are required. Uh, again, special 
special attention to the Title I annual meeting that schools are required to do. Last year, we spent a lot of time going over those, the evidence that you submitted to make sure that it met the ESEA requirements. And so this is just a reminder that there are a lot of requirements that must be met with that annual Title I meeting. 39 and 40 only have to do with districts that answer a specific question, one of those criteria questions. Um, supplement, not supplant, doesn't necessarily need an upload, but it may, so it's included on this document. Comparability has had some changes made to it, so I'll go over those when we get there. And finally, most importantly, our contact information. If you're having problems logging in or you need a login access, you can contact Renee or Becky, or you can contact me. And if you have specific um, questions related to the content of Cycle 3 in the Annual Core, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And let's log into the DMI. I have my username and password entered. Actually, I want to review one thing on there. If you have trouble logging in, you can email DMI Help Desk. Um, it, you, Renee and Becky check that regularly, but if you want faster attention, because it may not be a daily thing that they check, then make sure to email one of us or call one of us so that you get quicker, quicker attention. If you're a first time user, this is where when you get the email, you can accept that invitation and you'll be able to create your login. This will allow you to reset your password as well. Yeah. When I click on this, if it, you will be directed to um, right to your two instruments you need to complete. Um, I think I'm not in the right year, so let me get in the right year. Actually, let me show you something. Um, for this year, since we're in cycle three, if you're new and you were not the Title I director four years ago when we were on cycle three, then what you could do is go back four years, update that, and you'll see that there is another cycle three. And so you can see what your predecessor uploaded. Um, you can go directly to the LEA filing cabinet if you want. You'll notice that there's the district engagement policy. There is the, oh, I have my fictitious elementary compact because this was not an actual LEA. Um, so, so that's how you can find previous year's documentation. And let me go back to the prior year. If you go to LEA overview, it will help you get back to that home page. It will make it a lot easier to navigate. So going to this year, and cycle three. If I come on this overview page, the status is in progress. If you submit it to me, then it should change from in progress to submitted. So if you think you submitted it, you didn't click it twice, it will still say in progress. So that will be another clue you can use that, oh, I didn't click it twice. I need to go back and submit. If items not in compliance, it says zero now. If this is returned to you, then it would say how many items you need to address, readdress, I should say. Okay, I click on that and it takes me right to the criteria questions. Is your LEA a charter school? I'm gonna click yes. And is your LEA a district? I would click no if I'm a charter, right? So if I'm a district, it would look like this. Notice there are no, the radio buttons for none are not, are not filled in right now. Just to make it easier to answer all scenarios, I'm gonna answer yes to both, which no one would do. Click save. And then if it doesn't already um, open up all the items, you might wanna click this open all, uh, expand all is the word I'm looking for. 
And you can see, based on my, the way I answered my criteria questions, I don't have just four, I have five, right? I said, if you're an LEA, you'll have four that you need to respond to. If you're a charter, you'll have two. Uh, actually, I lied, you'll have three. On item 31, the first item, it's our LEA parent and family engagement policy. Now, four years ago, LEAs went through uh, the requirement of updating their engagement, their involvement policy to an engagement policy because no child left behind was replaced by Every Student Succeeds Act. And in that six, Every Student Succeeds Act, LEAs were required to start using different terminology, which hopefully in turn helped to really engage families and not just invite them to things. It, in this, you'll notice that there has been a change to the formatting. That this interface is not friendly. We all know this. So over the years, I've tried to make it more friendly. And this year, I've made a major change to the way it looks. Because last year, I noticed people weren't reading anything. They were just uploading what they thought needed to be uploaded. They're just like, let me get this done as soon as I, as quickly as I can. And it costs me a lot of time and it costs them a lot of time to have to send it back, to have to re-upload the, the right thing. So hopefully in this new formatting, you can see what do I need to do, the required actions. Will provide the most current version of the LEA's parent and family engagement policy. Okay, now I know what to do. Now I need to make sure my engagement policy has everything it needs. Okay, so I come down here and I see the resources. There's a checklist of required components of the LEA parent and family policy. How do I get to that? Well, right here it says see resources tab. So I come down, click on resources tab, and I have my checklist for LEA parent and family engagement policy. Now, I'm not going to show you that because that's something that you can find. Otherwise, I'll have to stop sharing and share again. Now, you see that there are additional resources if you are interested. In this new format, uh, actually, I started this last year, I believe. It gives you the instructions of what you need to do. Because again, since you only do this once a year, it's easy to forget how to do this. So the required, uh, the instructions say to upload the current version of the family engagement policy, you go to the all documents gray tab below. Okay, where's my all documents? Right here. I click on that. And the next thing says, plus attach document. So I have to find that. And again, it's in the smallest font possible, so it's easy to miss. And I'll click on that. And the instructions said to click choose new file. And if you have an existing file, you could, well, actually it's easier just to choose a new file and have it ready to upload. So I want to, um, share with you the document that I'm going to upload. This is an actual family engagement policy from Salt Lake City School District. And I want to use it as an example of one way um, a district, LEA, was able to get around a problem that I discovered um, LEAs were having. Um, according to the ESEA, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the uh, LEA and school level engagement policies should be reviewed regularly. It's tough when you have a policy and it's board policy to have family members weigh in on that, to have parents weigh in on that on a regular basis. And so what Salt Lake City School District did is they have their, their board policy on engagement but then they are going to create, or they did create administrative procedures, which are much easier to change without needing to go before the board. Those are things that family members and parents can weigh in on much more easily. So it's a lot more flexible to make changes to year after year. 
So on the administrative procedures document, this is something that Salt Lake would get input from parents on. And I just highlighted a few items that the LEA will build the capacity of families, mostly through, through schools. But again, this is the LEA responsibility, not the school's responsibility, but the LEA will empower schools to create opportunities for families to learn how the school system works. Um, schools will create opportunities for families to learn about the core standards as well as the state assessment results, how to interpret the state assessment results. So you can see they have useful kind of family friendly language. It's hard to, to get that policy procedure language in a family friendly language, um, but they, they've done that. And so you can see that this is a lot easier to go through with family members to make any needed changes. Okay, at the end, it indicates that the Title I coordinator will conduct an annual evaluation. Um, they'll, meet, they'll identify what families need in order to help with their children's learning and the strategies that will support those successful school home interactions. So some really nice language in a flexible document that can be reviewed without having to take it before the board. Going back to the DMI, I'm going to choose a file, and I have right here, I have my family engagement policy and my procedures, so I would upload both of those. When I click open, you can see that that file has been uploaded there. Um, I can add a description, but I don't need to because the title of it is pretty specific. And then instead of save, you click the attach button and that will attach it. So I come down here and I notice all documents now says there is one document attached and I can see that it's ready for me at the state office to download. Now, the next thing you need to do is change the status. So right here, the self-review, it still says that it's in progress. So I need to edit that. And when I click edit, I change the status from in progress to meets requirements. Now, if for some reason I need to explain a caveat or maybe we're not in compliance, so instead of meeting, um, saying we meet requirements, does not meet requirements, then I could explain why we don't meet requirements and the timeline for that. And I think in the next item, it will be easier to give you an idea of how that will be utilized. So meets requirements, again, you need to click save. And when you click save, you get this next item. So it makes it easier just to go to that next item. One thing I forgot to tell you is another way that I try to remind you that an upload is needed is that there is this red box and on other items it has in capital letters upload needed but I think I ran out of space with this long title. Now item 32 will only populate for charter LEAs and that's because as a charter LEA it seems kind of ridiculous to have an LEA level parent and family engagement policy and a school level parent and family engagement policy. So you are allowed to combine the LEA, the requirements of the LEA and the requirements of the school in one document. It doesn't save you any of the uh, work, but it just puts it all into one document. Again, in this new format, what is the required action or actions? Uh, what, do, what does the engagement policy need to have? The instructions to upload it, and here are some reflection questions um, in case, you know, four years ago, there were, a, there were some LEAs, I'm just guessing, that instead of including parents and family members, they just created the document because it was a board policy. Well, parents and family members really need to be meaningfully involved in the development review and as necessary the revision of that parent and family engagement policy. So I can go to the resources tab 
to find a framework of all the combined elements of an LEA and school parent family engagement policy. So this gray tab down here, I see I can download the framework for a combined parent family engagement policy. Again, I'm not going to share just to save a little bit of time of stop sharing screen and all that. So I'm going to go to my all documents. Again, if I forget what the next step is, I can come up to instructions to upload, go to all documents. I look for that plus sign. And then before I attach the document, let me show you an example of a charter LEA's combined document. This document comes from Greenwood Charter School. And Greenwood Charter School has best practice going on. They have a variety of dates here when it was um, initially adopted. And the ESCA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, replaced No Child Left Behind in 2015. So they had this involvement policy going on in 2014. And so when cycle uh, three came around in, in 2019 and they had to update the policy to an engagement policy and include some additional components, you could see it was revised then. Um, it was also revised in September uh, a couple of years ago. And then the board adopted that, those changes, those revisions in October of that year. I want to show you my favorite line in this policy. I know it sounds odd to have a favorite line in an engagement policy, especially at the district level or at the LEA level, excuse me. Um, that part three is the engagement policy components in this particular engagement policy. Greenwood Charter School will listen to parents and learn what parents think, dream, and worry about in an effort to gain partners in education. Okay, I love that line. It just en encapsulates what engaging families is all about. Okay, coming back to the DMI, I'm going to attach that document, choosing my file. My Greenwood Parent Family Engagement Policy, the title shows up. I can see that that file is there, and then I need to attach. Again, I can check that. It's ready to download at the state side. And then before I can move on to the next item, I need to change that status by pressing Edit and coming down to Meets Requirements and that save button. It will allow me to advance to the next item, which is the school level parent family engagement policy. If I'm a charter LEA, this will not show up because I have that combined parent family engagement policy. If I'm a district LEA, this will show up. The requirement is only to provide one but you can definitely provide more um, family engagement policies at the school level. Okay. Now, there is a note that small LEAs with two or fewer Title I schools, okay, so like Paiute School District, for example, only has two very small Title I schools. Their family engagement, their family school community councils often combines parents from both schools at the district level to make those kinds of decisions. And so it may be easier for a district like Paiute to have one combined policy like a charter does. But you definitely don't need to. Both schools could have their own family engagement policy. Okay, the instructions are right here. Reflection questions just to see if you're on the right track, if you need to make any changes. And then there are additional resources, including the framework for that school level. Um, so if I go to resources, even though it's not listed here, there's the framework for the combined for those very small Title I LEAs, district LEAs. And then there is the framework for the school level parent family engagement policy. I need to upload a document. 
So I'm going to come here. And I have another exemplar that I will show you. This one is from Liberty Elementary in Murray School District. They make their parent family engagement policy look like a like an inviting kind of brochure. Hey, what is this? Let me find out more about that. So consider the, the format of the parent and family engagement policy. Is the, is the policy itself engaging? Uh, the picture is a little distorted because I have it as I have a larger, I have it zoomed, zoomed in. So it even has a table of contents. So doesn't that captivate your attention? And so going through, you can see, again, it, this is in family-friendly language. They have added quotes to it, emphasizing the need for parents to be involved, okay, talking about communication. So they've gone beyond what's required in a, in a policy, a family engagement policy. They included their compact as part of that, which I think is smart. And you can see, again, this is pretty family friendly. And the capacity building, what, what they will do. So let me hop back over to the DMI. And I'm ready to upload that document by attaching, choosing that file, my Liberty Elementary, and attach. Change the, the status by editing, meets requirements, and save. Okay. Going to the next item. This is our final item. All LEAs will do this, both charter and district. And this is the compact. The compact is part of the policy because the policy mentions that schools will create a family engagement compact or a school parent or a school family because often schools will include students in it. So if you say school family, that includes parents and students. Um, and so uh, it is its own document, but it's within the policy. So the required action, provide a current version of at least one school level. And so obviously that's for districts that have more than one Title I school and for charters who are multi-site charters. So at least one school parent family compact that's developed at the school level. And then it has the requirements listed under here. Um, the instructions again of how to upload that. Oh, one thing I did want to point out: every single item has my contact information. So if you get if you're in one item and you have a question, you don't have to go search for my contact information. You can just shoot me an email or a call. In all documents. Oh, I did want to bring to your attention the additional resources tab. So under that, there are three different resources. There's a sample compact for the elementary and at the secondary level. And then there is the checklist of, there are three things that have to be included in the compact. And then the rest of it is up to you as a school community. Um, obviously parents have been um, in, included in that development and or revision. Okay, let's go to adding the document. Choosing that. And, oh, I thought I already did this. <laughs> oh, it's the compact. Okay, let's go to the compact. Oh, well, Murray had their compact in there, so I'm going to call that good. It is very hard for me to multitask. So to talk and do this is extremely difficult. Okay, make sure I change the status. It still says in progress. So I need to edit. And meets requirements and save. Okay, now if I go, 
Why is there a next? Oh, yes, there's a next item. This one, if you look at the required actions, it says the LEA makes an assurance. So this parent notification of underqualified teacher is only an assurance. No upload is required. Notice there's no red box right here in the required actions. It doesn't say to upload. There are no instructions telling me that I need to upload a document. So this is just continuing from last year's cycle two that was focused on parents' rights. This is just a reminder that you need to be ready to send out a letter to parents of students that have been assigned to or taught for four or more consecutive weeks by, by a teacher or substitute teacher that is not state qualified. Now I've included all the, um, all the ways to see if they are state qualified, that they have one of three educator licenses, the professional, the associate, or the LEA specific, they have the required areas of concentration for their teaching assignment, and they have the required endorsements for their teaching assignment. So the area of concentration, are they secondary? Are they elementary? Occasionally I see, especially for charters that are K-12, that a teacher might have a secondary license, but they're teaching at the elementary level. And so they would not be state qualified in that, in that capacity. They have the required endorsements for their teaching assignments. So this is a little more to the secondary level. And that they show up in CACTUS as USOE endorsed. Okay. Um, there is under the resource tab, a sample notification letter. If you don't have one ready to go, if your schools don't have one ready to go, that's something that you could look at that sample and, and make changes to it to meet your needs. The, there's an infographic that um, was shared in our new Title I directors meeting that shows the Utah educator licensing structure. So no uploads required for this. So all I have to do is change the status. And it, we are in compliance with that one. Okay, so let's just go to... Let's see, it says previous items, so we have no more items to upload. So we can go to our cycle three. And I'm just going to go make sure all of them meet requirements. Oh, I know I said I left this one in progress. This one, what will happen in this situation is I will go to submit it. And right now I should have a submit button right up here and I don't. So by going back to this item and changing the status, you see it didn't save because I didn't press save. Then I should go back to cycle three and still says in progress. What am I doing wrong? I'm multitasking. That's what's the problem. Maybe I didn't change that. Okay, now let's cross our fingers. Okay, all of them meet requirements. And after changing the submitter to my right email, I now have a change status to be submitted. So see in red letters, it says confirm that that status has been changed. And so I click on here, but every year there are one or two that miss the second click. And they're always surprised when I contact them in December saying your, your DMI has not been submitted. And they know they did, but they just didn't click it twice. So I would click that one more time for submit. And now if I go to my LEA overview, I can see that that part of the DMI has been submitted and the annual core needs to be submitted now. So that takes us to the criteria questions. 
I've made it a little smaller so it all fits on one screen so you can see that more easily. In the six criteria questions, if you are a charter serving just a single site, then you would answer yes. If you are a charter who manages more than one site, you would answer no to the first question and yes to the second. If you are a district, not a charter, then you would answer yes to the third and no to the first two. Now I'm gonna skip down to six. Does your Title I Part A funds, does your, do you use Title I Part A funds to pay the salaries of employees? Almost all LEAs do. So if you're a charter single site, you will probably have two yeses and all the rest no's. Make sure you don't leave these as none. If you're a multi-site charter, you would have two yeses and all the rest would be no's. If you are a district LEA, then you would have at least two uh, completed as yes. Now, number four, did you consult with any private schools? Whether they decided to accept the equitable services for private, for their private school or not, if you consulted with them, then you would check yes. Did you provide services? So this would be if you consulted with them and they said, yes, we're interested in equitable services, then you would check yes. If your district did not consult with private schools or, and, or if the private school decided not to accept those services, then those would be left no. I, for simplicity, I'm going to answer all of them yes, which no LEA would do, but this will just auto-populate all the potential questions so we can go through them. Yeah, I'm gonna save that. And this is a good example of how no items are showing up for me, so I can expand all over here. Let's say that I want to see what was done last year. Just as a review, how do we get to last year? We go to the LEA overview and we change that to last year's and then update that. So that will allow me to go to the LEA filing cabinet and again, find documents that were uploaded last, last year. Not to use those again for this year, but just to give me context as to what was uploaded last year. Or I could even see notes between me, Val Murdoch at the state, and you, the LEA, in case you had to, um, I sent it back for changes and you made those changes. Those, those are visible in the items. Okay, let's go to this year. And now we're on the annual core. Okay, the first item is about the report card. And I mentioned this when I was going over that updates document that you had as an attachment with the email that had the, the link to this training. Um, this is the very first year that LEAs have been required in the DMI. They've been required for multiple years according to the Every Student Succeeds Act. But the first year in the DMI that you will have to prove that you have a link to the report card on your website. Now, if for some reason you don't have a website, then there's an option B, but almost all LEAs have websites. So we're gonna focus on option A for the majority of the time. Okay, so the required action, provide evidence that the report card is made publicly available on the LEA web website. And to do this, you need to provide a working URL to the LEA report card that is located on the website. I don't want a, I don't want you to upload a link to the report card itself. I want a link that goes directly to your LEA website and shows that you have it linked not to this page but to the page, for instance, if you are Ames, then you would have this, this particular link 
on your website. Okay, uh, we don't want we don't want parents to have to come here and then to have to search for their school. We want it to be much easier than that. We want it to land on exactly your LEA. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, if your charter LEA, it could look like Early Light Academies does, and I use this their Title I web web page as an exam, example of the way to do things uh, to help parents find information related to Title I. So we scroll down, you can see the report card, Early Light Academy School Report Card. Okay, and then so I want this link. I want to be able to go right to the page on your website that has the report card listed. Okay, when parents click on this, it should take them to the Early Light Academy school report card for 2022-23. And I know that's a bit that information is not available yet. So this might be one that you hold off on uploading that evidence until that information comes available. Okay, what does it look like for a district LEA? Well, for Provo City School District, here's their Title I page. It looks like this, LEA report card. So again, I don't want to link to that. I know where that is. I don't need to know where that is. I want to link to your LEA page that then shows me the link. And when I click on it, I want to be taken to your LEA's report card. I don't want to be taken to this general page. If you have questions, my contact information is right here. Okay, so now this is new, how to upload a URL. So we come to all documents and we attach document, even though we're not attaching document. Then I go to my website. I get the link to that page. I copy it and I come down here, link to a web page URL, paste it, and then I'll do a title. Um, this is Provo City School District LEA Report Card. And I attach. What does that look like? I come down here. See, it has a different icon. It's it's a URL icon, and I can open that. If this link is broken for whatever reason, if this link takes me to the USBE website, if this link takes me to something that's not your LEA web page with the link listed, then I can just easily mark this does not meet requirements and send it back to you. So on this one, come down here and change the progress to meets requirements. Now, if it doesn't meet requirements, which some of you may not because you didn't get that memo that I sent out last year that beginning this year you would need to, even though it was listed in the DMI, then you might say this is in progress. Timeline, um, timeline, so IT will have okay, and then save. So you see it does not meet requirements. So your DMI will not be approved until that has been taken care of. But if you're the kind of person that needs to get this done, I totally understand. So you can you can make you can mark it does not meet the requirements. Give me a timeline when it will. That should be before December 1st and then go to the next item. This one, see the here's the capital letters when the title is short enough to allow me to say capital to, to type in extra words and it has that red box. So I know an upload is required. In fact, when I read what is the required action, it is to complete the evaluation of family engagement, LEA self-assessment. Last year was the first year that you were asked to do this. 
So where do I find that self-assessment? When the instructions tell me to access it, I go to the resources tab and download the form, save it to my computer, complete it, and then upload it. So there are lots of resources. How do I know which one I need? Oh, this says right here in the description, complete this updated LEA self-assessment and upload to filing cabinet. So it's slightly different from last year's. So you can't just use last year's and change it and upload it. So make sure you download this revised version. And then I'm going to show you, I've already filled it out and I'll show you what that looks like. This self-assessment came about because LEAs and I realized that they weren't incorporating an annual review of the LEA family engagement policy. So I read through that um, section on Salt Lake City School District's administrative policies that said that the Title I coordinator would be responsible for conducting that annual review of the effectiveness of the family engagement policy. Um, so that section of the ESEA has been broken down into seven parts here. And for each part, you're going to rate your LEA as not yet in place, as an emerging practice, an established practice, or an innovative implementation. And obviously, if I've marked to not yet in place, then that means that you will not face consequences if it's not yet in place. But if, as I compare last year's to maybe next year's, not necessarily this year's, but next year's, we should see some movement over the years as you um, pay attention to what is required in this section. So you can see how I rated myself, my LEA, myself. And uh, I don't have an innovative implementation yet. But for those LEAs that marked one or more than one under innovative implementation, I did reach out to them last year and ask if I could share their, or if they could provide me more information on that innovative implementation. And I shared that in the spring um, Title I director's meeting. So if you have some, some excellent innovative things going on when it comes to family engagement, please mark this box. Don't be too modest. There was one LEA that marked all of them innovative implementation. I kind of piqued my interest, but I never heard back when I asked them for more information. So this is about reflection. It's about being honest with yourself and with your colleagues and with your uh, school administrators. New this year, um, so you're reflecting on last year. So new this year, you're going to identify one or more areas of strength related to your LEA's family engagement. So I went with this first one. Last year, it could have been an emerging practice or not even yet in place. So at least this year, it's an established practice. Okay, every year we're going to conduct focus groups. So in, in school year 21-22, we conducted three focus groups at three different Title I schools. So it's the LEA's responsibility, remember, it's not the principal's responsibility, but you certainly can recruit school administrators in your, in your assessment of this, of the engage, family engagement. So it was done during the spring. It was our first attempt at getting feedback in this manner. Um, we've already revised our focus group questions based on their responses. And we look forward to making this more meaningful to giving, having parents and family members give and us get input. The second question is about identifying one or more areas of potential growth. So probably that's going to be something that's not yet in place or an emerging practice that you want to focus on. So I focused on um, this communication um, to let me just read it. We, we just assume that administrators, front office staff, and teachers know what parents and family me members need to establish trust and to feel engaged in effective communication. We need data to provide us 
um, that that is right, that our hunch is right, that we're doing it, that they're doing it correctly. But it could also show us that we need to, to make improvements. So what is one or more ways that we have in, that we have planned to address this area or areas of growth? We're going to collect data. We're adding focus group questions that specifically address the level of trust in the school as well as how are parents perceiving the effectiveness of that school home, classroom home communication. So, so again, just an example of how to fill that out. I notice in red, it tells you to go to the next page because last year there wasn't a second page. For those of you who are new, you can change the year to last year, go to the LEA filing cabinet, and find out what your predecessor, how your predecessor marked it. All right, all documents. And then we're going to attach the document. And this is our self-assessment of the annual family engagement evaluation. And we'll attach that. Change our status to meets requirements. And we'll go to the next item. I hope you can see this. I made it small so everything shows up on this screen, but I know that it might be. Oh, I'm not sharing the right screen. Sorry. I knew that would happen at least once. Okay, let me go to the previous item just to show you on that family engagement that it has been attached. So that download shows up. Again, all I did was go to the attached document. I can do it again. The USBE self-assessment and attach. Now I have two of them uploaded. And I changed the status to meets requirements so I can just go to the next item. Okay, the Title I meeting, again, as I mentioned previously, this took a lot of time for me to go through 150 to 160 Title I meeting evidences of that Title I meeting, whether it was a PowerPoint or a detailed agenda or watching um, specific parts of a back to school night that you gave me timestamps for and you had an accompanying outline of that recording to, to show that the annual Title I meeting has all the required components that the ESCA requires. So just as a reminder, this one has a required action of uploading evidence of this year's annual Title I meeting. That evidence must show that all parents and family members were invited and encouraged to attend. As of last year, you can no longer just say, yeah, this was done in our SCC meeting or this was done in our charter board meeting. It must be something that is held for all parents like a back to school night. It's not enough to say all parents are invited to our board meeting. All parents are invited to our SCC meeting because those formats are not made for all parents. The focus is a charter board or a, a school community council. So that's the first required part. The next one is that parents of those schools are explain the school explains what it means to participate in Title I. Like what is Title I very briefly and how are Title I funds utilized at the school? Maybe what the goals are and how Title I funds go toward helping the school accomplish those goals. Uh, the third one, explain what it requires, including family engagement. Hey, we have a parent and family engagement policy at the district level and at the school level, or we have this combined parent family engagement policy as a charter LEA. And we also have a compact. And, you know, family engagement is an important part of being a Title I school. And then the last one is to explain the right of the parent to be involved. And any of those other additional rights that last year you indicated would be, would be included in this Title I meeting. I have 
evidence. It must be from this current school year. It must be detailed so that I can see all these components. Now, if you want some more information, notice the additional resources include required topics and suggested tips, as well as a sample presentation. So I come down here and I can see the sample tips, or excuse me, the uh, required tips and topics for annual Title I meeting. That make sure you review that before you submit the annual Title I uh, meeting evidence to me. And then the sample annual Title I meeting, that's just a PowerPoint example. What I don't want is to see that same PowerPoint just uploaded, changed with the school's name on it. That just doesn't work. What I do have is an example that I would like to show you. Scholar Academy has done an outstanding job for the last two years in ensuring that their, doc, their evidence meets that requirement, that it shows all of the required components that the ESEA has. And so you can see that it's, it's an annual Title I parent meeting. It's not a board meeting. It's not a school community council meeting. It's for all parents. Often schools will combine this as part of their back to school night. That is not required. It can be separate. It definitely should have its own separate agenda. So it's not enough to upload. If you're not going to upload the PowerPoint like Scholar Academy does, if you're just going to upload an agenda, it needs to show me every single thing that was discussed during the Title I section. It, I get, I, I still get the evidence uploaded of the back to school night, and it just says, item C, Title I, and it doesn't give me any indication of what was discussed during that. And so that item is returned to the LEA to make corrections on. Okay, so this just is a PowerPoint. It's just a copy of the PowerPoint that shows me all the information. You can see that Scholar goes into what the curricula, what curricula are used at their school. That's one of the, the rights of family members goes into what the engagement policy and compact are and additional rights and how they can be involved. So let's see just a review of how to upload that. Come to the All Documents tab, attach, and my meeting. Edit the status. Let's see. And next. Private school notification. If you're a charter, either single site or multi site, you will not see this item. This is only for district LEAs. And even if you don't have charter schools in your LEA, you will be presented with this item. So that there is a required action to upload evidence that notifications were sent. So if you have one or more private schools that your students living in Title I school boundaries potentially could be attending, then you need to reach out to them. Okay, there are resources. In the resources, you can see that there are sample letters, both in PDF and Word form, whichever works best for you. Uh, there is the equitable services calculator if you need that. So you're going to go to all documents and attach that letter that you sent out or uh, perhaps an email, just an email that you can cut and paste in a document if you would like. Now remember, you need to do you need to do multiple attempts if you don't hear back from them. I know that some LEAs send certified letters to the private schools to ensure that they receive that information. That's not necessarily, but it's it's definitely an, a possible way to go about this this particular requirement. 
here's an example of a letter to um, discuss more than just Title I. These are all the parts that require, all the parts of the ESCA that require consultation with private schools. So they're in the resources tab. There's also a letter just for Title I. On the second page, there's a fillable part where they could send it back to you either via mail. Um, so you could send it back via mail or email. Yeah, I don't have a fax on there because I don't know a whole lot of people that are still faxing, but that's still a way to do that. You don't have to use this particular letter or format. You can use your own. Let's go back to the DMI. And we will attach the document. This is my, whoops, the district invitation. Okay, and I'm going to change the progress, change the status. And moving on, we get another question. If we answered, yes, we consult with private schools as one of our criteria questions, then this item will populate. Oh, I need to go back to a previous one. If you answered, no, we don't consult, then you won't see that question. If, no, here's a note. This is back on 39, the invitations being sent to private schools. If after due diligence, the LEA does not locate any private nonprofit schools with students who reside in their qualifying LEA attendance areas, then you will change the status from in progress to not monitored. So if you have no private schools around you whatsoever, then you would change that. Um, there are some private schools, there are some district LEAs that have private schools with, that are close by, but they but they serve a different population than the district serves. So district chooses to utilize its Title I funds for elementary students. Obviously, if it's a private school for high school students, those high school students, there's there are no high school there are no high school students res residing in elementary school boundaries. I mean, they could potentially live in the boundaries, but they don't go to those. They wouldn't be attending those elementary schools. So if you're in that situation or if you have no private schools, then the status would be not monitored. If you did send out invitations and if the private school said, hey, yeah, let's, let's find out about this Title I, then you would need to complete item 40 and that is the affirmation of consultation. So for each private school that you consulted with, you're going to upload a signed copy of either the USBE form or your LEA specific form. If you use an LEA specific form, it must have all the required components. Um, to, you can access that form. It's under resources. And I will show you what that looks like. Here you see it's a consultation that was conducted last spring, but it's for this school year. So that's why it shows up as this, but it took place back in the springtime because that is timely, which is one of the requirements of this document that you were able to engage the private school in a conversation about the next school year. It has the information of both the district and the private school. Uh, um, officials. And then here are those Title I requirements. The Title I requirements are different than all the other title or all the other title programs that require um, consultation. Of course, it's different. So at the bottom, after we talk about all this, and they found out based on that calculator that they only have $200 as part that will go toward the services provided to them, they were like, mm, yeah, that's not really what we were thinking we would get out of this whole thing. So we, we're just going to, we're going to go with Title II. We like Title II. Title I isn't going to help us this year. Okay. 
or they might choose to participate in that. The signatures are required. Make sure you get signatures. They don't have to be electronic like this. You can um, print this off. You can have them sign it while you're meeting with them. If you do a Zoom consult, then you could choose to send it to them, um, get their electronic signature. And remember that you must maintain a copy of this, not only for the DMI, but for your own records, as well as a copy of what plan came about. If they chose to participate in equitable services, what were the answers to all of these kinds of things? And then, of course, you're going to upload this to the DMI. And as we have done previously, we'll come to our all documents and attach. I do want to go back to the resources and just let you know, if you're only consulting on a Title I, you would use that form I just showed you or your LEA version that has all of those components listed. If you would like to combine all of the ESEA programs, notice that the, those documents are there too. So you can just focus on Title I or you can focus on all ESEA, all ESEA programs. And let's change the status to meets requirements. Obviously, if you consult with two schools, then you would upload both, both signed consultation affirmations. And moving on, the next two are still for district LEAs that are providing services, equitable services to private schools. This notice under the required actions, it's make an assurance. There are no uploads required for this one, but it's you are assuring that you have set aside an equitable portion for the private schools. And that's done in, in Utah grants, but you're, you're assuring that that has taken place or will take place, depending on what how you complete this with respect to the Utah grants. So meets requirements, save. And on our next item, this is the services that you provide. So the funding was 41. The services are 42. And you are assuring that you provide equitable services to those students that are comparable to, they don't have to be the same as the ones that are the students in your district are getting, but they must be equitable in comparison. So meets requirements, save. And now we'll probably be back with all LEAs. So hopefully if you're a charter LEA, you fast forwarded through those sections. And now all LEAs must make an assurance that they maintain, they maintain effort each year. So maintenance of effort, not just that you maintain that effort year after year, but you also have policy and procedures that help guide how you will maintain that effort year after year. And so if you have those policies and procedures, and if you've been monitored in the last three or four years, you do have them because Tammy required that you submit those to her, you will Mark that meets requirements and save. Again, you don't have to upload that policy. The next one is supplement, not supplant. Notice this says upload is possible. And the required action says makes, makes an assurance, but the instructions give you four different scenarios. Depending on which scenario you find yourself in, that would be the uh, required action. So if no changes have been made, to your supplement, not supplant methodology. And this is just for LEAs that have more than one um, site. Then you are going to mark uh, that you are in you meet requirements. You don't have to upload anything. If you did make changes to your supplement, not supplant methodology, then please come down here in the edit portion and say changes were made.
and then save that. Well, it says still in progress, so we change that to meet requirements. And then you would upload that amended document. The third scenario is if you were a single site LEA, most likely a single site charter, and you added a campus to become a multi-site LEA, then you need to create a supplement, not supplant methodology, and then you must upload that. And then if an LEA is exempted, um, and then the qualifying reasons are listed above that you only have one school, that you only have Title I schools, or all grade spans are exempt. Are exempt. Okay, if you meet those exemptions, then you would mark not monitored. I'm going to mark meets requirements because we're uploading our changed methodology, although I'm going to skip the part where I upload it. A com uh, comparability. Again, this will only show up if you're a multi-site charter or a district LEA. On the comparability analysis, this has been required for multiple years. Last year was the first year I was, I was the one that reviewed all the fiscal items. Usually I just reviewed the programmatic and then one of our fiscal managers reviewed the fiscal part. Well, last year I took over the entire review of the DMI, and I noticed a pattern of both confusion and maybe ways that the comparability form could be could be improved. So I'll go over those changes. Hopefully, if you're a single site charter LEA, you're fast forwarding to uh, the next item, which I believe is time and effort. So. Yeah, you'll need to pause on the time and effort part because comparability is going to take a minute. Okay, so the required actions is that you conduct an analysis of comparability for the current school year. So a lot of these are what did we do last year? The annual Title I meeting at the school that needs to be a current year and the comparability analysis needs to be a current year because what happens is if when you're conducting the comparability analysis, and something's off, you need to make a correction before you allocate the funds to the schools. Okay, there are, let me just read through this to give you an idea of comparability. There's gonna be a spreadsheet that you, you complete. And the, um, the analysis ensures that services provided to Title I served schools are comparable to those that are provided in non-Title I schools prior, that's why it's current year, prior to the expenditure, oh, I said allocation, but prior to the expenditure of Title I funds. Essentially, an LEA, uh, LEA must show that Title I served schools have equitable access to state and local dollars. So the comparability analysis is only looking at state and local. It's not looking at federal funds. Anything, anything that's funded federally is not calculated in the comparability analysis. And it's looking at how Title I schools are allocated those dollars and the services those dollars provide compared to non-Title I schools or other Title I schools. This requirement also applies to LEAs where all schools are served by Title I funds. Now you're exempt if, oh, sorry, this is the opposite. You're required to demonstrate comparability if you accept Title I funds, and you do because you're here listening to this. You have at least 1,000 schools in your entire LEA, and there's only one or two that don't have 1,000. Most all of our LEAs have 1,000. Even multi-site charters have over 1,000 and have at least one Title I school with more than 100 students in a grade span that includes two or more schools. For example, you have a Title I school that has 102 students, and you have another school in that same grade band. For instance, an elementary school, a K-6 K school with over 100 students, and another school, K-6, with over 100 students. 
and then the instructions. You're going to access the spreadsheet in the resources tab. There are three options this year instead of two options, and I'll explain more. Go to our resources tab, and we're going to download that. I'm actually going to upload a completed comparability form. At the bottom, you see all these colored tabs. We're going to start with Form A, go to Form B, and then we'll talk about the three options. Form A has been shortened a little bit, again, because last year was the first year that I reviewed this. I noticed patterns of confusion and or irrelevance. So you may have your business administrator complete this, or you may complete this, or somebody else in your district may complete this. That's why the information is requested, because it might not be the Title I director. Then there are three requirements of comparability. You need to have a, a district or charter-wide salary schedule. You need to have written procedures that ensure there is equivalence among schools in teachers, administrators, and auxiliary people. And you need to have written procedures to ensure equivalence among schools in the provision of curriculum materials and instructional supplies. Again, these are things funded with state and local funds. And then down here at the bottom, because I believe comparability might be one of the most complicated parts to Title I, um, if you have any questions as you go through this form or about comparability in general, please enter them here, or your BA can enter them here. And then I will incorporate those into resources and or trainings. Form B, this is going to determine uh, how many forms down here you're going to need in, in a way. Okay, so our column one is the grade span. So for my LEA, I'm going to start with K-6. And the number of K-6 non-Title I schools is four, and the number of Title I schools is three. This blue column is optional. So this is for LEAs that have some smaller elementary schools and some larger elementary schools. So they could compare them separately or they could compare the small schools with the large schools just to see if they're comparable. All of our schools in our LEA are pretty much the sim similar. So they're 400 to 700 students. You could break that down. Maybe you have the small school at 400 and all the rest are six to 700 sc schools. We have only two non-Title I schools that are seven, eight. We don't have any Title I schools and we only have one uh, high school, and it also does not get Title I funding. So we're focused on only the elementary because we have no Title I schools to compare to. So let's go through the options. Again, you will only need to complete one option. In years prior, they had you completing the, a combined option one, two, or a combined option two, three. Hopefully this saves you a little bit of time. So in option one, you list the schools from form B. So I have four non-Title I schools. You list their names up here, the grade span, the enrollment, and if you choose, the total instructional staff, emphasis on instructional, that is not paid with Title I funds. Now, when it comes to instructional staff, that could be teachers and other personnel assigned to schools who provide direct instructional services, such as music, art, and physical education teachers, guidance counselors, speech therapists, and librarians, as well as other professional or personnel who provide services that support instruction, such as social workers and psychologists. If you are going to use paraprofessionals, I would, I would advise you not to incorporate paraprofessionals into this document. 
But if you choose to, then you should carefully consider whether a paraprofessional supported with state and local funds is considered an equivalent to a teacher or other instructional staff member. Um, some, if they choose to incorporate paraprofessionals on this, paraprofessionals that are just paid with state and local funds, then you might count it as a 0.5 FTE just to make that different so that a Title I school that has three paraprofessionals and a non-Title I school with three teachers, that, that's not equivalent. So again, my advice is to leave paraprofessionals off and then just compare uh, direct instruction, but also those, you know, the counselors, the support staff. So I come down and oh, so the support staff right here. If so, not any paid with federal funds. So if you have 0.5 down here paid with federal funds, half their salary is federal and half of it is state local, then you could do 0.5. Okay, so this will calculate automatically for you the student to staff ratio. I come down to my three Title I schools, put the enrollment as well as the instructional staff FTE. And then this will automatically tell me, you can ignore this column once it's changed, either yes or no. If yes appears, then it's comparable. So you see that this is multiplied by 1.1. Um, that has to be within uh, it can be, sorry, this is always hard for me to explain, that they're equal to or less than, if the ratios of column five are equal to or less than 110% of the average ratio of the non-Title I schools, then they're, com they're considered comparable, and this will automatically calculate that for you. If you have a lot of schools, like Granite does, and you need a second page, I have a second page there but it will not automatically calculate. So you may want to, um, you may want to just add, uh, may want to add rows instead of going to a second page. Um, if you have small, if you have large schools, you could do that on option one and compare your smaller schools on option two. One of the cells I couldn't get to work is this enrollment size. It, for some reason, it's showing up as only classroom, classroom teachers only. So this makes no sense. So ignore this one. Okay, if you want to do option two, this is comparing the amount of per, per pupil allocation for instructional supplies and curriculum materials. Okay, I do the same thing. I list the schools, the enrollment, as well as the instructional supply. And remember, these are only come from state and local, no federal funds in there. If for some reason I get a no, whether it's on option one, or option two, or option three, then that tells me I need to make an adjustment to that school's allocation. I need to increase the state and local funds going towards the curriculum and supply before any, before going any further. Once I've made that change in allocation to Bing Cherry, Bing Cherry Tree Elementary, then I can come back and change that. If, if for some reason I just can't get this to work out, then I need to use one of the other tests of comparability. One more time, you only need to choose one of these. That's why they're different colors. So form A, form B, and one of the options. The most common option is option one. I don't have anything to show you for option three because to get the amount of staff-based salaries is a little beyond what I have data for. So I just choose to let you do that if you want to. Almost no LEA has used that option before. Back to the DMI, we come to our all documents page. Oh, actually, I can't remember if I showed you this. Oh, yeah, I did. So you're going to download this document. 
you're going to save it to your computer. And then you're going to fill it out. Save it again so you can then come to the All Documents tab and attach it. Okay. We are definitely on the downhill. Just a few more items left. Whoops, know what I forgot to do. Actually, let's let me show you what that looks like. I think I did before on the cycle three, but just to give you a reminder that I did the comparability analysis, but I forgot to change the status. So I can always come to this overview page by clicking on what the what the instrument is called. So we're on annual core and I can review. And again, this shows me we just have four more left once I go back and change the status of this one. And the next item, time and effort. This just requires a blank form that reflects your LEA system of internal controls. So just a few years ago, instead of having to follow the exact requirements of what the time and effort forms look like, LEAs were required to come up with their own system of internal controls to ensure that the time that is being charged to Title I is accurate, it's allowable, and it's properly allocated. And as well as you must have a written policy. Again, this is something Tammy asks for when you're having an on-site monitoring visit. LEA's written policy that outlines the process and procedures for documenting the federal and non-federal activities. Here are some of the things that the time and effort records must have to show that you have those internal controls going on. And just a reminder, digital time cards, you can modify that. You can just like get a screen grab of a blank one, or you can um, you can white out, you can, I don't know how to say white out in a digital sense, um, that personal identif identifying information. Uh, so we, we just want a blank version of that. Okay, I'll show you an example of that. Made it. Okay, so here's just a simple time effort. It has our districts, a name, has the elementary school on it, has the certification period. It, there's the job title, the name of the person, the program that they're being paid under, the total staff signature. If it's electronic, obviously it doesn't need the staff signatures on there. The supervisor somehow should provide a signature or approval and then the date on there. So you upload that, you change that hopefully without unsharing. Okay, so on our time effort, again, go to all documents. And I hope I've convinced you to keep all of the evidence in one folder to make it easy like this. So you might have an even better way to do that. Attaching that and changing status. And moving on, like I said, the last three are just assurances. So this one is called uh, fiscal property records. 
equipment inventory. So the LEA makes an assurance it has a written policy that outlines the process and procedures for maintaining records and inventory of equipment purchased with Title I funds. It doesn't have to include books or furniture. If you meet that requirement, then you can go ahead and change that. And again, if you've been monitored recently, you do have that in place. The audit, if you have uh, federal funds totaling over 750,000, you're making an assurance that you have a single audit conducted yearly. If you receive less than 750,000 in federal funds, you make an assurance that you have a fiscal audit conducted yearly. Since it's just an assurance, all we do is change the status and move on to our last one. This is another assurance that the LEA maintains written policies and procedures for procurement and expenditures. This also, you probably have done if you've had a monitoring visit in the last few years. If you're not sure, then definitely look for that policy. If you're being monitored this year, I would definitely look for it to see if it needs any type of update or revision. And since there's no next button, I'm gonna come out to the annual core overview page just to make sure I have changed the status. Remember, I left the report card as does not meet requirements with the timeline of when it would be completed. And since I changed it from in progress to a different status, I have a submit button, even though I put it does not meet requirements. And so once I receive this at the state, then I will mark that as does not meet requirements as well and I will send it back to you. So once you, once your IT department gets the report card posted to your website, then you would resubmit that. Um, and what will happen, you'll click on this, and I can't show you now, um, but it will, it will give you a blank, or, or it will give you an option in this LEA self-review box to resubmit. So you'll just click resubmit, and then you will um, res you'll, there won't be a resubmit button up here. You'll just change the status to meets requirements, resubmit. And then if you would send me an email, because I don't get notification from the DMI when you resubmit. I do when you submit the first time, but not when you resubmit. Okay, so going back, I'm going to change the status and submit. And going to my overview page, I can now see that both of those are submitted and one of them is not in compliance. That's all I have for today. If you have questions as you view this, or if you want um, more help on this, please reach out. Remember that there will be a uh, office hours on September 29th from 1 to 2 in the afternoon. There will also be a new Title I Director's live training via Zoom on October 14th from 9 to 11 a.m. Thank you so much for joining me in this training, and I look forward to seeing your completed DMIs.